Are you uh, she you're welcome to have your family back here if you'd like us a few. Okay. Right there? All right, very good. I'm very pleased to announce today my appointment of Major General John A. Jensen as the 31st Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. General Jensen is superbly well qualified to assume these enormous responsibilities. This year, General Jensen has served as the Commanding General of the Minnesota Army National Guard's storied 34th Red Bull Infantry Division. He also serves as a full-time Chief of Staff at the Minnesota National Guard Joint Force Headquarters. In 2001, he served as the Security Force Commander of the 1st Battalion, 34th Infantry Division in Kuwait. In 2003 and 2004, he was the G3 Plans and Exercise Chief at the headquarters of the 34th Infantry Division in Bosnia, Herzegovina. <clears throat> I knew I was going to miss that one. In 2007, he served as commander in the 34th Infantry Division in Iraq. And he was again deployed in Iraq for 13 months in 2009-2010 as the Assistant Chief of Staff of the 34th Division in Basra. In 2016, he was on assignment as the Deputy Commanding General of the U.S. Army in Africa. In between those deployments, he has managed to spend time at his home in Apple Valley with his wife, Cindy, who's here with us today, and his three children, Keely, who's also with us, and daughter, Atlee, and his son, Jake, who are in school outside of Minnesota. <clears throat> I thank General Jensen for his superb service to our state and his nation. And I congratulate him on this appointment. My pleasure in making this announcement is tempered only by my sorrow in beginning to say goodbye to our current Adjutant General, Major General Richard C. Nash. General Nash has provided outstanding leadership to the Minnesota National Guard during the past seven years. The Commissioner of Public Safety, Mona Dolman, my Chiefs of Staff, Tina Smith and Jamie Tinsher, and I, have all developed close working relationships with General Nash through numerous state disasters, floods, tornadoes, and ice storms, many guard deployment and return ceremonies, and beyond the yellow ribbon designations for Minnesota businesses, cities, and counties, a program whose expansion the General has spearheaded to his great credit. Best of all, almost every time we meet, he brings us Kolotskis from New Orleans. I will have the chance to make more formal goodbyes and events this fall, but I want to take this opportunity, General Nash, to recognize and thank you for your extraordinary service to Minnesota. General Jensen, you have served under an extraordinary Adjutant General, and I have no doubt that you will continue this tradition of exceptional leadership to our country's best National Guard units. General Jensen. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Governor Dayton, sir, uh, for your confidence. Uh, I'm honored to be appointed as the next Adjutant General of Minnesota. And to Major General Nash, sir, I've, I've had many opportunities in the Minnesota National Guard to command forces and to have uh, senior level positions. And it's because of your friendship, your mentorship, and your leadership over these last 16 years. So, sir, thank you. To Cindy and Keeley and, and Jake and Atlee, uh, you know, obviously like all of our service members, I'm able to serve because of your love and your support. Thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank the Joint Force staff that some of them are assembled here today. I've had the honor and the privilege of the last six years to lead and work with, quite honestly, simply the best National Guard staff in the nation. Every day, you've taken General Nash's priorities and you've done the hard work and you've grinded through that work to ensure that the reputation of the Minnesota National Guard remained at the top and that we had the best units, both Army and Air, in the National Guard. I will miss the relationship that I had with you as your Chief of Staff, but I look forward to serving with you as your Adjutant General. And finally, to the soldiers, the airmen, and the families of the Minnesota National Guard, our most important resource. You will get my best. I will work hard every single day to ensure that you have the resources and the support both inside of our organization and throughout the communities here in Minnesota to ensure that you are prepared and always ready. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, Governor Dayton, uh, and good morning, first of all, and thank you all for being here uh, for this occasion of the Governor Dayton's announcement for the next Adjutant General for the State of Minnesota. So I appreciate uh, you being here with all the issues that are going on around the country and uh, in Texas and certainly in the State of Minnesota. So Governor Dayton, first and foremost, Jeanette and I want to thank you for the opportunity to serve Minnesota over the last seven years. Thank you for your very deliberate, transparent, and time-consuming process you established to select Major General Jensen. So thank you, sir. You had a, a list of very qualified candidates to determine who should lead our guard for the next seven years. And I commend you for your personal and difficult job that this has been for you and your staff. I'm proud of each and every one of our great citizen soldiers and airmen, as General Jensen alluded to, and the work that they have accomplished on behalf of our state and our nation, as well as our state employees and your staff that work very closely with the Guard, along with the other cabinet members that we interact with. Governor, under your leadership, our state has led the nation as a shining example of how supporting those in uniform should be done. The national recognition of our Beyond the Yellow Ribbon Network, of which you, Governor, initially secured funding for while you were serving as our U.S. Senator, and that has provided a blanket of support for all service members, military families, and veterans across our state. We are very proud to have you as our Commander-in-Chief. I leave this Cabinet position knowing full well that uh, our Minnesota National Guard and the entire state has contributed greatly in a period of history that will be looked back upon as a remarkably important time in our history and our state. As we have now de deployed thousands of soldiers and airmen since 9-11, as well as responding to dozens of state emergencies, we were always ready, always there. But I leave, too, knowing that the Minnesota National Guard is in great hands under the capable leadership of Major General John Jensen. You know, as, as General Jensen mentioned, I have personally served with him in both Bosnia and Iraq, and I've known John since he was a major, and he is a true professional that you will come to certainly appreciate. He has directly reported to me over the last decade, whether as my director of operations and overseas deployments or as our Chief of Staff for the past six years. Governor, this will be a very seamless transition and you and the state will continue to be able to rely upon your guard. John has commanded every level available in the state of Minnesota to include his current assignment as our Commanding General of the Minnesota's 34th Red Bull Division, as well as being a Deputy Commander, Commanding General for U.S. Army Africa. His leadership skills are unparalleled and I'm confident that he will lead our Minnesota National Guard and Air National Guard with a steady hand through the uncertain times that lie ahead. So to Cindy and Keeley who are here today, congratulations, and also for the entire Jensen family. The Minnesota National Guard continues to be in great hands. And I would also conclude by saying that our thoughts and prayers from the Minnesota National Guard, and I would also say from the entire state of Minnesota, are with those who are uh, the first responders in Texas and Louisiana as they continue to respond to Hurricane Harvey. And we are prepared as a state, Governor Dayton and the National Guard, if required, to continue to support those in Texas. Thank you. Any questions on this subject? Do you know if you'll, I'm sorry, do you know when and if you might get called to help with Texas? Right now, ma'am, we're, thanks for the question, we're in very close communications with the National Guard Bureau in Washington, D.C. Our chief of the National Guard Bureau works very closely, obviously, with the Secretary of Defense and any types of federal assets that would be required. At this point in time, and we had a teleconference last night with the chief of the National Guard Bureau, all states, all adjutants generals, and at this point, there's regional responses from those states that are close to Texas but not effect, affected to, to send soldiers and equipment that's required by the governor and the adjutant general of Texas. And so there's a very specific list of things that are required at this point in time. Again, if Harvey continues to go east, it hits Louisiana, again, it may demand more assets. But we are on a, on a, uh, a list of those states that have been notified. We've provided those the types 
have provided National Guard Bureau with a list of types of equipment that we can respond and how fast. But at this point, there's probably six or seven states that have sent soldiers and airmen and equipment to assist Texas. So until we're asked, and at this point, the Adjutant General last night from Texas said, don't send anybody. We'll call if we need additional assets. So that's where they are at this point. Apparently, it's a steady state. They have what they need from the, both the federal government and the uh, states that are contributing forces. I I'm approved in advance uh, any request from the governor of Texas or from the Texas National Guard for assistance from Minnesota. We have a, a joint uh, partnership relationship with all of the states where if uh, asked uh, for this kind of emergency, we will respond and we are prepared and Thanks to General Nash, the Guard, Minnesota Guard is prepared to respond immediately if asked. General, can you talk a little bit about what your leadership will bring to the, to the Guard? You know, the last decade has been about beyond the yellow ribbon and a huge number of deployments. This year, of the legislature, there some concerns about the budget. What will be your focus? Well, as General Nash talked about, I've, I've served as his chief of staff for the last six years, and so, um, Everything that we've worked on as an, as an organization, I've, I've had a, a part of. And so the three things that come to mind very quickly are, are three things that are, uh, would be very consistent and common to people who follow the National Guard. First and foremost, readiness of our, our soldiers, our airmen, and our units. So if we are ever faced with an event like what is taking place in Texas and Louisiana, we would be able to respond, and we would respond in a professional way that could accomplish the mission. The second of all would be recruiting and retaining a diverse and talented soldier and airman to man our units. So that helps us get to the readiness that we want to be. So we'll continue to seek out the best uh, that Minnesota has to offer to serve in our formations. And then finally, uh, as General Nash talked about, our, our great success in the Yellow Ribbon Network. Uh, we will encourage that, we'll maintain that, and we'll work to expand that. Because our soldiers and our airmen serve uh, in, in in support of their communities, so that community support is, is very important. You know, yesterday we were at the State Fair for the Military Appreciation Day. It was a great event, and part, part of that great event was the outpouring support that we got from, the, from uh, everybody at the fair yesterday. So those would be three areas that would be uh, a, a focus of mine, but they're very common in part because I've worked very closely with General Nash over the last six years to establish our current priorities. Thank you. The General Nash is the Yesterday we were celebrating the 34th, uh, sorry, the 100th birthday of the 34th Red Bull Division. And if you look at the medals and streamers they've received for their service, starting back in World War I, it's been extraordinary. And I know personally, the last several years, uh, there are men and women in those units that have been called to service three, four, five, six, I think the most is seven times. And they come forward and we're, according to General Nash, at 118% of our strength. So it's an extraordinary uh, compliment to the heroism of the men and women who serve in our Minnesota National Guard who are willing to come forward knowing that they're likely to be deployed again into combat zones. And we're just very blessed with such a, what everyone says, and I certainly agree, the most outstanding National Guard units anywhere in the country. You may be 118%, but and you talk about recruiting. Are there certain types of people out there that you're looking for with certain types of backgrounds? No, we're looking first and foremost for, for individuals who want to serve their community, serve their nation, because uh, it's, it's not easy. It, uh, as the governor just mentioned, you know, we have deployed thousands of soldiers uh, in support of the global war on terrorism. We believe that we're gonna continue to deploy soldiers uh, throughout the world in the uh, upcoming years. So first and foremost, what we're looking for is someone who is dedicated to do that work. As I mentioned, we are always looking to mirror our community. So diversity recruiting and retention will be very important to the organization as it has been over the last six years. We need to reflect our community. And so as our communities across Minnesota change, we need to change with them and we have. Uh, we've had great success in, in the re uh, recruiting and the retention of diverse members in our, in our organization. So those are two things that we would be looking for. Again, as I mentioned, we'd be, we're seeking out the best that Minnesota has to offer to provide them opportunities. Uh, that, that's what General Nash has provided to me. That's what Governor Dayton is now providing me is an opportunity to serve and continue to serve. So that's what we're looking for. And do you feel you're diverse enough right now to match the 
state. Uh, I would I would say we are working tirelessly on on that effort. And so to, to answer your question, no, we're not diverse enough. Uh, we are we are seeking, you know, all types of uh, of people to serve in our organization. Uh, uh, we are a very open organization, a very tolerant, and a very inclusive organization, and we'll continue uh, to be that way uh, going forward. As you talk about the national level, there's been talk about transgender troops. Has that hit the Minnesota National Guard? Did you have any thoughts? Well, uh, we're you know we're part of the Department of Defense, and so uh, the the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Air Force, and the Secretary of the Army establish policy and regulation that we have to follow. And so we will follow the regulations and policies established. Uh, we have had, we do have transgender soldiers in our formation uh, that under what is still the current policy have uh, come out and identified them themselves as transgender. We have supported them and we will continue to support them uh, going forward. Those members have had concerns over the past several weeks as the different orders have come back and forth and perhaps general nationals. Well, I you know, I won't speak for them. I have, I have concerns as we appear to have one policy and now might be moving towards a different policy. I just, I'm very concerned that we have a consistent policy uh, with that. I, uh, I truly believe this. Uh, service should be open to everyone. Not everyone will select to serve, but it should be open to, to everyone. How do you read the message that's coming from General Mattis on, on that front in terms of, it just seems like there's a mixed message coming out of Washington. Yeah, and, and I, I can't comment for, you know, Secretary Mattis. Uh, you know, what I, what I believe is, is uh, you know, consistent message is it would be the best message for us. And so, uh, you know, as I said, we are currently employing the current policy and, and we will fully implement the current policy until, uh, until we get further notice. More personal questions. Are you from Minnesota originally? What caused you to join the country? Uh, I, uh, I'm originally from Council Bluffs, Iowa. I've been a member of the Minnesota National Guard since 2002. Uh, like, like a lot of soldiers and airmen, I, I initially enlisted uh, for the education benefits. Uh, I was a college student. And uh, what happens you, uh, to, to a lot of us, you start to serve and you start spending time with, with quite honestly, the, uh, the, the best our nation has to offer. And one day you wake up and you look back and you say, my gosh, I've been part of the Minnesota, or I've been part of the National Guard for more than half of my life. And um, that's kind of what happened uh, with me. I had no intentions of ever being an adjutant general, being a commanding general of the division. I wanted to serve my six years and get out. And that was about 35 years ago. So, uh, I, you know, but one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was enlisting. And your plans go more smoothly than that six-year plan. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'll tell this quick story as well. We, we moved to Minnesota for what we thought was going to be a two-year assignment. That was 15 years ago. So uh, I guess timelines aren't my strength. Yeah. With respect to the here in Texas, it's very hard from this vantage point to get any sense of scale. Somebody on social media said it was like 100 Katrinas. Do you have a sense of it? Can you put it in perspective on what kind of response you may have to put together with respect to what we're dealing yeah, with? Yeah, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about a potential response because I'm not the adjutant general right now. General Nash is our adjutant general and will continue to serve as our adjutant general to 31 October. And so, sir, if you would like to, to take that question. Sure. I, I'm only involved in terms of what the information comes from the National Guard Bureau. What we receive in our Joint Operations Center on a continuous basis, it's, we operate that 24-7 over on Cedar Street. So we, we get continuous, almost immediate updates. And a lot of that that we receive is in preparation for it. So as I mentioned to the earlier question, National Guard Bureau is preparing a packet of possibly up to 30,000 additional uh, Air and Army National Guards, if required. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Texas has not asked for that. But again, what we do in the military is always plan for the worst case. So we're doing operations orders and planning all the time. So what would we anticipate they would need based upon, you know, the most recent Hurricane Sandy and what we did during Katrina and Rita? Would, and I was involved with uh, Katrina when I was assigned to the U.S. Northern Command uh, when that. Uh, struck into Louisiana and Mississippi. And so the military since then and FEMA has learned a lot of lessons. And Secretary Fugate, the former FEMA uh, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, has done a lot of great work preparing the federal government to lean as far forward as they can without instituting the Stafford Act and the president declaring that. And so 
they all have mission assignments and they give those to states to uh, be prepared for. And as the governor mentioned, the, the emergency management uh, assistance compact that we have and all states have assigned. So they can be not only guard units coming to that, but also law enforcement could be called in through that EMAC process. So the system is in place and I think it's working very, very well now that FEMA has obviously learned a lot of lessons since Katrina. So the magnitude of the storm, you know, when we talk 50 inches of rain, you cannot wrap your, your brain around that in terms of what the magnitude of that and then the uh, residual of that is. And so obviously the military has a lot of high water vehicles that we use for our overseas federal mission. And so those assets are available to rescue people, transport them through water. And so there's a lot of specialty skills that are involved uh, that the military has, both active component and reserve component, both guard and army reserve. And so those are all being looked at at the federal government, as I mentioned earlier, with the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. So we look at what we would go down through a menu of items that they would need, what we could have available for the governor and the adjutant general. So those are all in preparation for requirements. And there may be requirements that the governor of Louisiana and the TAG there may need as Harvey moves to the east and up into the Gulf Coast to strike Louisiana again. But a lot of lessons have been learned and preparations, and so I would say that we're well prepared in the National Guard at, at all across the nation to respond if this continues to get worse in Louisiana. But open sources and, and daily reports, as you see, and recovery operations in Texas, we also receive. And so we think through those things and where we are, what we can contribute, and as I mentioned, you know, once that call would come through the proper channels to the governor and public safety, we would uh, launch and, and send whatever they required. That call comes, uh, how long would it take uh, to... Uh, I think we're going to let the uh, general step aside and open up to other questions. Thank you. See you. Okay. So how did you do the other day in the court? It says for six uh, justices to decide in due time and wait and see. What do you think of the nature of the argument? Was it I've never been there before. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. Certainly there are a lot of questions of both, uh, both uh, <clears throat> my attorney and uh, Mr. Kelly, the legislature attorney, and <clears throat> reinforces what has already been submitted in in, uh, in writing, and I'm not going to speculate where where it goes from here. Governor, there are some questions about whether you've had any communications with the leaders about a special session or anything like that. Have you? At the outset, we had you know a couple of exchanges, but I've not had any recent discussions. No. And have you discussed by email or text the the poison pill? When, when you realized that was in the middle? Uh, I told him how uh, unhappy, to say the least, I was with it. The, the, not only the content of the effect of it, but also the, the deviousness. There were people who knew that was in there. Legislators knew that was in there uh, while the legislature was still in session and you know, very <clears throat> reportedly very, very proud of themselves that they kept it uh, hidden and, until after they left. So they left. Governor, didn't I notice that uh, you made a point of going over and shaking hands with Doug Kelly, even though he's representing the other side? Why was that important? Well, he came, over, he came up to me. I was seated, and he came over, and I'm glad to step forward and greet him. I've known him for years. I had great respect for him. I mean, he said nothing personal. I don't take it personally. I certainly know he has a, his job to do, as uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hansen had for, for me and for Commissioner Franz, and they both, uh, I thought, performed uh, superbly well. If, if you win, then the case would be remanded back to the county court for discussion over the, the court funding issue. But beyond that, would that then trigger negotiations to go back to special session? Uh, it sort of it depends on the ruling. I mean, it depends on what the, how the, you know, the court, Supreme Court phrase, what, is, what it says. I'm not going to speculate on what that will be or what the consequences will be. No, but if it did happen, then would the negotiations start? speculate on hypotheticals. Regardless of what the outcome is uh, from the Supreme Court, how might that affect your relationship with Republican leaders moving forward? I've been in, in various uh, political disputes for 40 years, and I, I was uh, willing to set them aside and proceed. We both, we both, we all have the same job to do, which is to best serve the people of Minnesota. We may disagree on what the particulars are, but 
we share that mission, and I expect we all to resume our uh, collaboration in a constructive, professional way. Governor, what is uh, your concern right now about uh, the, the revenue uh, not matching projections? Well, it's very concerning. You know, it's only one side of the balance sheet. We haven't looked to see whether uh, expenditures have been reduced or whether they've been increased, but it, it underscores the volatility of these projections. Here we are just but five months after the last one was made, and, and uh, you know, it's for the next uh, 24 months, 23 months now, and, and already, uh, you know, there are variances, which is to be expected. <clears throat> so it underscores my concern, underscores the reason why I uh, want to bring the legislature back to reconsider those three tax revenue items that are, I think, very, very uh, th threatening to the future, the fiscal future of Minnesota in the years ahead. The tax reform talks going on in Washington, D.C., any advice for lawmakers? Well, yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't throw away a lot of the federal revenues. Once again, I went through two of these tax cuts frenzies under President Bush in 2001 and 2003. And, you know, they, they <clears throat> under President Clinton, when he left, the federal budget was in balance. In fact, you take out the Social Security surplus, that was about $180 billion, just the general operating fund of the federal government was in balance and was projected to be in surplus for each of the next 10 years. Well, uh, President Bush and the, con uh, the Republican leadership in the Congress uh, decimated that very quickly in 2001, then they came back. And that didn't satisfy a lot of the interest groups. They just made, whetted their appetite for more. So they came back in 2003, well, this, the 2001 wasn't fair to us. Some, so and so got more than we did. So the 2003 was, uh, is bad, and then the, the recession followed, and our deficits ballooned into the trillions of dollars, and, and we went from paying down the national debt and being in good condition when the my generation, baby boom generation, retires, and you got more demands on Social Security and Medicare, and now we're back behind the same fiscal eight ball, and, and anything they do there is likely to make it worse. Part of the projection, part of the February forecast, was predicated on the idea that there were expectations in the market that the Trump administration would engage in, in some tax reform that would stimulate the market, and that some of some of the projections were buoyed by those expectations. We've seen nothing but paralysis in Washington D.C. at this point. How concerned are you about that, and, and do you think that they'll have to ratchet those expectations in another direction going forward? Well, that's why it is a forecast, and and they did they 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 set forth what those assumptions were and. I think they were reasonable, but uh, turned out to be overly optimistic, and I'm sure that the November forecast will, will revise those according to what has happened up until then, but I, I expect that their prognosis is going to be not as optimistic as it was, and we have one of the reasons uh, believed for the short shortfalls in the first, uh, last, last few months were that the, uh, the uh, Taxes uh, reported in, in April for the last uh, calendar tax year were not as high. The people were withholding, especially um, about if they had the opportunity to wait until if, uh, further tax cuts were made in this year. So, I mean, all that becomes very speculative and very wrapped up in all of these guesses about what's going to happen to everybody in the next year. And as uh, Vice President Mondale said, if you're not afraid you should be, or something to that effect. He said, or he didn't say you should not afraid you should be. He said, but you said you're, you're, you're right to be afraid. Governor, Governor Walker called you trying to get you to restart tax reciprocity talks. They're apparently a little upset in Wisconsin that Minnesota bill you sign takes care of Minnesotans, but all the Wisconsin residents who come here now have to will be paying more. Well, we're not building the toll booth on the new highway to, to, to charge them when they come over here for shopping and work or sports. Uh, I have not heard from him, no. You know, our job is to, in all respect, take care of the citizens of Minnesota, and the legislature did so. Uh, Representative David's uh, instrumental in that, being a border district, uh, and provided for, uh, you know, make, make Minnesotans who work over in Wisconsin who pay higher taxes because Wisconsin taxes are higher than in Minnesota. I hope you didn't miss that point. I'll be glad to say it again. Wisconsin taxes are higher than they are in Minnesota, and for that reason, Minnesotans who work in Wisconsin pay higher taxes than they would. 
and uh, now this that will be, has been offset with a tax credit. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll continue to file two returns, which they've done, and, we, and most all of them do electronically. So there's no change in that, but they are, uh, will be made whole, and, and you know. I, uh, Wisconsin will have to take care of its uh, own situation. We tried, and, and Commissioner France and Commissioner Barley tried, have tried for like three years to, and, and I think the uh, Secretary of Revenue in Wisconsin has also tried in equal good faith to find a fit, but we have different tax structures, and each one came out with uh, Wisconsin owing Minnesota money at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, and we just didn't think that was a good arrangement. Governor, with uh, respect to the, the court case, I'm just wondering if your attorney, who was a former uh, Supreme Court justice, has given you any guidance on how long it will take for a ruling to come that justice said it would be in due course. Have any idea how long that would be? <laughs> no, he hasn't speculated. I haven't really pressed him on it. I think in due course, it means what it says. <laughs> We're all just wait. I asked if we would find, you know, get advance notice. He said Prob probably not, except maybe a, a brief, an hour or so in advance. So. Uh, your administration's efforts to save uh, services like ICU and maternity care at the Albert Lee Hospital? Uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith has uh, taken uh, the leadership in that, but given her relationship with Mayo Clinic in Rochester, the Destination Medical Center, she's going down to Albert Lee this Thursday to continue the conversations there. We're, we're very, very concerned about what Mayo is doing in, in terms of the effect of it and also the, the lack of, of uh, satisfactory communication with the people of Albert Lee in that surrounding area before these decisions, if they are final decisions, were made. Uh, I think it's, you know, we've heard from Mayo their reasons why they can provide medical, better medical services to that region of Austin and Albert Lee through this realignment and the difficulties they, they believe they would have in continuing to provide the excellent quality of medical services in all of those fields if they would remain uh, as, as they are now. But I don't believe that's been communicated effectively at all to the people of Albert Lee and, and Lieutenant Governor's been driving that message home with, with Mayo that they, they should have already and they uh, certainly need now to communicate uh, how this is going to benefit, if they believe it will, the citizens in the Albert Lee Austin area. Does Mayo have a special responsibility given not only its stature but that the state just cleaned up a whole lot of help for them in recent years to, to take care of things like that? Well, uh, Mayo has a very special stature in Minnesota and a, a very you know, strong service, medical service network in southeastern Minnesota. And in, in addition, and, as, and one result of that are higher medical uh, costs to, to families, businesses in that, that region because of the quality of medical, of Mayo's services. So it's not just the uh, public expenditure in Rochester, it's the fact that People throughout southeastern Minnesota have been paying themselves for superior medical care, which I, I believe they've received. But in this case, anything that threatens that, I think, is a, you know ser calls in a serious question the responsibility that Mayo has to the people of that region, uh, first and foremost. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 